So how do you see deaf people in the first place? So we've got to work you out of that way of seeing us. If you have seen deaf people merely as objects of pity, that uh, people with disabilities, oh, poor, thing, poor folks can't hear the birds sing or the music. Well, if that's the place you're working from, then we've got to work you out of that space initially so, so that you can see that's not the way we see our lives. The shot of it right now I find really interesting and kind of telling. What do you see? You see two different ways to sit in the same space. This is simply a different way of being. Rather than thinking of deafness as a hearing loss, the corollary or the opposite of that is thinking of deafness as a gain. It's a creative, cultural, experiential way of being in the world that has many benefits that we're just now starting to uncover, certainly in the world of architecture. I'm hoping when other people hear about the term deaf space that it instills in people first a, a genuine kind of honor and respect for the deaf community and that, it, that there's a kind of respect for how deaf people see the world uniquely so that, that that term deaf space goes back to the wisdom that deaf people bring to the, to the world. Our goal in the Deaf Space Project has been from its beginning really to try to codify this amazing idea that deaf experience could live in architecture. Not only is it supportive of a way of being, but it's also an aesthetic that's expressive of a deaf way of being. What role does architecture play in expressing who we are? In many ways, I think what's interesting is the ability to have an extension into landscape but then have a protected side to it is really kind of a fundamental aspect of deaf space. It goes back to that almost foundational idea of when we were all hunters and gatherers of wanting to have protection at our back and views of threats coming towards us. This building in a lot of ways was the first building that we had designed based on the principles of deaf space. There's a lot of attention paid to what this would look and feel like. Some of the initial ideas had to do with the, um, the glass elevator that allows people, occupants inside the building to see what's happening uh, outside or if there's an emergency they don't, they don't really have a problem with communication if something happens, you know, you get stuck or whatever, you can communicate and say, you know, kind of, hey, I'm stuck, whatever. But what's interesting is a lot of times you see people who will be having a conversation through there. In this space then you'll see the the wood seating was a place where um, the kind of symbolically to sit together and be, have visual access to one another. We learned a lot of lessons, so there are a lot of mistakes in this space that it's hard for me to tell the story without pointing out some of the things we would change. Um, one of which is the very tall space. The light's very nice, got a nice diffuse quality. But one of the problems we do have is a very high space with hard materials. You can hear there's a lot of, there's echo in here. That's very problematic for any of us. I mean, this is just a poor acoustic quality. But it's also quality of reverberation that is really impactful for people who, with uh, either cochlear implants or hearing aids, particularly 
cochlear implants will pick that up as, as noise. So that noise tends to drown out the signal of, say, my voice or, or whatever you're trying to pay attention to. The deep arc then becomes a problem because the teacher wanting to connect with the student starts walking into that space and now has left people off to the edges are now visually not necessarily able to pick up on what's being said. It's always a, a, a real tension as to what that arc is. If it, is it a deep U or is it more of a crescent or is it two? There was a design that we had where I would be standing on the other end of the table and the two students would be across from me. The partners would be across from me and I would sign to them. I realized that naturally I would come and have the students be sitting side by side. But I would naturally come in between the students and sign so they could both see me from this angle. And so we designed the tables to be wider and longer. When I was with a student back here conversing with them, again, myself, I'm deaf, and another student wanted my attention was waving their arms and screaming, I couldn't hear. And then I'd turn around and realize that I would have to walk all the way through these lab tables and get to the other hood where the other students were. So we realized that's why we have them instead of at the front and the back of the room, we have them on the side of the room. The offices here have glass. The original design was not to have any film on the glass. It was just a wide open window. It was a little awkward because if I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues or with a student, I felt like a fish in a fishbowl. Everybody could see it. Being open, you would expect that for the deaf, but you know, we wanted to have some privacy as well. Historically, I used to think of buildings as really separate entities. They're, they're objects, right, that we, uh, in many cases for architects, they're sort of fetish objects where we're obsessing about what these things are shaped like or look like. The deaf space wisdom is really brings forth this idea that buildings are really not separate from us. They're a manifestation of us. If you think about it in those terms, the importance of how a building supports your daily experience. For example, something as simple as how the light's coming through this, these windows right now completely changes the dynamic or the mood of this space and the kind of conversation we can have and the kind of the, the clarity of which we are thinking within this space is influenced by this sort of cask around us. Now as we're trying to become more cognizant of it, that experience of deaf people to really claim and have an identity around certain spaces is having an effect of empowerment. Not only of being able to be more comfortable in a space, but to be in a space and be reinforced by the aesthetic of that space.